I just said a need. Right. right. We all have needs, whether it's biological needs or relational needs or spiritual needs or financial needs or emotional needs. I'm probably missing one or two needs in there, but, but you get the idea, right? All of us have needs. Everyone who's listening on the radio somewhere has a need for something. And we could stand out on the corner of Franklin and, and Pine all day and ask people, and every single person would say they had a need, if they were being honest. So the scripture doesn't say that the distribution went to any that had an unmet need, just simply a need. In reality, the greatest need that we all have, and why I was hoping everybody would raise their hand, is that we need an encounter, an experience, a relationship with the divine. And the greatest impediment to having a full healthy, holistic relationship with the holy or the false gods that we have in our lives and in our world. There's no greater idol in the world then, in the first century, or the 21st, or any century in between, than money. And perhaps what the first followers found was that their possessions were possessing them and inhibiting them from having that full relationship with God. Jesus taught that if anything interferes with that relationship, we should get rid of it. From the Sermon on the Mount, we see here he He's, act, he's saying this rather fictitiously that, you know, if your right eye is causing you to sin, cut it out. Please, no one do that. I think the lawyers have to, I have to say that due to the lawyers, right? right it's not a, a literal ideal. It's a figurative ideal that whatever is keeping us from fully surrendering our life to Christ should be removed from our life. And in the first century, in the first community of Christians, apparently their possessions were interfering with that life. And therefore, it was eliminated because their life in Christ and with Christ was more important. And that's our, our first lesson for the day, that followers of Jesus surrender all. I almost had to sing that this morning, but, but I didn't. So there's another reason why they sold everything. Maybe on a more practical level, all of the things that they had were assets. They were resources. They were gifts, if you will, that could be used and deployed to help bring about the kingdom of God. And those assets weren't doing anything to help people in their relationship with Christ, but what they sold them for and put into the pot could be used for that purpose. You know, if we believe, as we will sing in the doxology in, in a few minutes, that all blessings flow from God, then we should use those gifts that, we, that are received as an act of worship. That worship is right, any action that you take to praise God. And so our offering should be that way. By eliminating what was restraining them from fully experiencing a life of faith, well, they could then prioritize what was most important to them, and that was their relationship with God and their relationship with each other. The ideal of we love God, 
with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength in our neighbor as ourselves, living out the great commandment. Right? It, it reminds me of the story, the parable about the rocks, putting the rocks in the jar. So what you have there on the left and the right are the same exact materials, just put in differently. And if you don't put in the big rocks into your, your life bucket or your life jar first, they'll never make it in. So what the first church was doing was getting rid of some of the, the sand, the silt that was in those rock, in, in their jar to make room for the big rock. so that it would fit. So my, my question is, what size rock is God in our lives, in my life? And if it's a big rock, is it in the jar or is it sitting on top? Also, by, by selling everything, the first uh, followers of Jesus in the first church equalized themselves. Right? By selling everything, they had nothing personally, thus making them to have everything collectively. And it was only by equalizing the inequalities that they could then find mutuality and mutually benefiting relationships among the disciples. So if someone is, if you have an unequal relationship, it's always unequal. You push come to shove, that inequality is going to show at some point. All the kids can probably tell us about trying to say to a parent, you're not the boss of me. Right? And all the dads laugh, right? <laughs> it's an, and it should be an unequal relationship. Kids should not be equal to their parents. But in this capacity, in this light, equalization was the key element. By selling everything that they owned on a personal level, that meant that they had to depend on each other rather than on self. It was the only way they could survive. They risked a lot in order to make the first church successful. In fact, I, I believe that what they were trying to do is remedy the world's golden rule. Right? He who has the gold makes the rule with Jesus' golden rule. Which one rules in our world today? So uh, another way of saying this is that the community that they created was based on expecting people to share their gifts with each other because everyone is gifted differently and therefore, the blessings of the whole were greater than the blessing of the individual. And it could be used for the entire community's benefit. Perhaps even beyond just the, the, the small group of, of believers, but for everyone in the area. So our second lesson uh, of this passage is that the success of the church is based on sharing the gifts of each person. Perhaps another way of saying this in our language of our, of, of our vision is that when we, when we share our gifts with each other, we reflect Christ. So the result of living this life and in this way of surrendering all to Christ and being dependent upon each other in a mutually benefiting relationship is that at the end, day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. 
isn't this verse in a nutshell what the purpose of the church is to add to those being saved in the world is everybody in Colby saved do you think so our work isn't done you want to transform the world here's one way to do it is to let people share their gifts in ways that build up the community that contribute to the community while also emphasizing self-worth if I could rewrite this passage of scripture what, what we just read I would de-emphasize the economic verbiage in it because it gets misapplied in the Western world I mean, that's not that that's an important aspect of it but if you just stop with that you haven't heard the whole passage in the way in which I believe Luke wrote it I can't ever remember hearing a sermon much less giving one until today about this passage of Scripture because it gets heard as advocating communism or socialism or being a Bernie bro so here's my unofficial unorthodox unresearched revision of this passage that Bill just read and it's one sentence disciples invested in people and possibilities not possessions let me say that one more time the disciples invested in people and in possibilities not possessions you hear a difference in there Investing in relationships with people is the only way to learn what they can contribute to the wider community. And the kingdom of God can only be fully experienced when everyone contributes their gifts. And it doesn't necessarily involve putting everybody in a box to make it what I want them to share with. Our speaker this year at annual conference was the Reverend Mike Mather. He pastors a church in Indianapolis, Broadway United Methodist Church. Uh, he shared with us that it's an older church. It, it's glory days, quote unquote, have long passed. They have nine kitchens in his church. Those of you who have served or are serving on the trustees, can you imagine the meeting of someone coming in and saying, those eight kitchens just aren't enough, we need a ninth? <laughs> can't even fathom that. <laughs> but that's what they have. 27 bathrooms. Witt and Poppy love that. But during, he's been appointed to this church for 16 years, and... And, and this is how he said it at annual conference that that he's had to painstakingly have funerals for ministries that don't invest in people and he has spent a lot of time ending programs that are designed to minister to people rather than to help them find the divine spark within them this church sits in this neighborhood that's full of drugs, full of gangs, and uh, most people live in a house owned by a slumlord. Knowing that he had to begin somewhere to transform his church, well, around 2010, he changed the way in which they processed applications or people coming in to the church's food bank. He said that rather than asking people how poor they were, right, such as, you know, what, what assistance are you on? When's the last time you've been here? Uh, how many people are in your house? And therefore, we're, you can only get this much uh, in food uh, based on that. Rather than asking people how poor they were, 
they began asking them what skills they had and what were they rich. So he changed their application process, threw out the old one, and, and gave it three questions. So if you want food from their food bank, you have to answer these three questions. What three things do you do well enough you could teach them to someone else? What three things would you like to learn that you don't already know? Can you see the linkage between those two? That maybe there might be somebody who comes in who has the skill set to teach you what you don't already know or vice versa. And then the third one is who besides God is going to go with you along the way? This is a reminder of one of those needs that we have is that sense of community, the sense of belonging to something bigger than ourselves. And people in these neighborhoods feel so isolated. You want to go out and play when you know the gangs are roaming the streets, right? Probably not. So it's a reminder about relationships. Can you see the difference? Those of you who, who have worked at Genesis or other food banks or, or been a part of those processes, to see the difference in the dignity and the aspiration and the inspiration that these questions could actually pump up. At conference, he shared the story of Adele. And so uh, this is his book, Having Nothing possessing everything. And I want to read to you the story of Adele, because I, I wouldn't be able to, to recall it in the detail that he did, and it's written in his book. So let me, let me just share with you her story. This is one of the first people who came to the food pantry after we began using our new questionnaire was Adele. Three generations of her family were living in her home, and she was working part-time at the University of Notre Dame as a cook. She told us she was a good cook, and we said, prove it. When she asked what we meant, we asked her to cook lunch one day that week for the custodian, the secretary, and the pastor. The lunch she prepared was fabulous. Shortly after that, we heard that the leaders of the neighborhood organization were planning to meet at a restaurant. The church secretary told them, don't do that. Meet here at the church and let Adele cook for you. They did, and they paid her for the meal. Over the next nine months, Adele catered three events in the neighborhood. Studebaker Elementary was holding a parent-teacher meeting, and she cooked for it. The Southeast Side Neighborhood Health Center held an open house, and she provided the food. Memorial Hospital held a press conference in our neighborhood and she served refreshments to the reporters. Then the Chamber of Commerce contacted us. They wanted to have an all-day meeting of their leadership group in the church building. Since they were going to be there all day, they wanted to use the kitchen. He didn't say which one of the nine they wanted to use, but uh, we told them they could, but that we preferred they use our caterer, and they agreed. We took $20, our only financial investment, and brought Adele a thousand business cards that said, La Chaparita Catering, Spunky Tex-Mex Food. When she fed 70 of the business and civic leaders in the community, she put those cards to good use. She also got connected to the Michiana Business Women's Association, and a year and a half later, she opened Adelitas Fajitas at the corner of 8th and Harrison and in Elkhart, Indiana. And I think I've got, whoop, let me get it there. That's Adele and then her restaurant. If you can read really good, it, it doesn't say Adele is on there anymore because uh, she died in 2013. And so that's the new owners. But that's her restaurant. If we had asked Adele how poor she was, we would have ended up being poor for it. We would also have missed a lot of great food. 
Adele taught us that if we asked different questions, we would discover a world of gifts we didn't know existed in people's lives, and we would see different results. If we began looking for people's gifts rather than people's needs, then even better things than we thought possible might materialize. If we hadn't taught Adele how to cook, she knew how to cook. We hadn't given her any life skills. She already had those. What we did do was invest in her. We paid her to share her gift, and then we found others who were looking for someone with that gift. We were practicing the theology of abundance by looking for and naming the gifts of people who are thought of as poor and needy, Throughout the Gospels, Jesus proclaims good news to the poor. Likewise, our telling people who thought they had nothing to offer, that they had gifts, was indeed good news and very effective. If Adele had shown up two weeks earlier, we would have never have asked her about her giftedness. The gift would have been there, but we would have missed it. We began to think that building on the gifts of people rather than on filling their needs could hold the key to changing the odds for everyone. Isn't that a powerful story? I think there are folks like Adele here in Colby. My guess is there are. You know, I want to I want to give thanks to our administrative council here as I try to shift and bring this home into our setting. That one of our goals to implement our, the vision to reflect Christ throughout our lives is to do a gift-based inventory of people in the church. What a great idea. And then I read this and I'm like, well, I love it when it all comes together. So the long-term goal of, of what we are introducing today is to actually do this in the wider community, but for now, I, I, let's start here, right? Under that auspices of you have to start somewhere, let's start right here in the church. I'm a big believer in that God only does ministry with the willing. The unwilling, it's really hard to do ministry with yet to see that happen. So you have to be willing, like the first church, to surrender and to risk putting something out there and to see if it can be used to bring out the gifts in others and to share your gifts with God and with the community. This week, for example, let me show you how limiting what we're currently doing is. This week, we had a call. Hey, I need a ride from the hospital back to Colby. Our only option right now is to send out what, what are, is a very ineffective method, uh, an email blast. And I don't believe anyone responded. Am I correct? Huh? Not with a yes. Yeah, we had several saying no, but not with a yes. In a 500-member church, not a single person said yes. On the gift survey that you're going to be handed on your way out, one of those gifts is transportation to help in these kinds of situations. Once this gets fully operational over the summer, and if anyone has the gift of doing things in a database, Please mark that down, because you will get called. All right, so once this gets fully operational, all that the office, specifically Kim, will have to do is to find people who said, yes, I'm willing to do transportation, and send them the email, or, or make those calls or text messages, however it is that's the most effective way of reaching you. So. Circling that in, let me also say it this way, circling that or any of these doesn't lock you in to saying yes every single time. 
what it does do is to offer yourselves for that skill set. My guess is that Linda and Amy, who do our funeral dinners, would love to have more options and more people to, to call. And my guess is there are others who would be willing to, to help if they were just asked. So this is making those connections like what that survey it was trying to do. And again, being on that and getting a call doesn't mean you have to say yes. It just means you're being asked. No is, is always okay, but it means you're probably going to be asked again until you say, take me off that list. So as you leave today, uh, members of the administrative council and the person who was in charge of that isn't here. Lynette, do you know who is helping the pass? Oh, good. Okay, so Carolyn and Lynette are going to be at, at the corners uh, as you leave to pass out the time and talent resource inventory. Read through it. Some things are inward towards the church, like helping to usher or be a liturgist, those kinds of things. But many of these are also skill sets that can be used in mission here locally. The prayer and action teams that are here uh, as a part of Sacred Heart this month, I think it's fantastic. And my guess is when they leave at the end of the month, there's still going to be needs. So this can be deployed to help with that and to create mission opportunities right here in Colby to start connecting people that have the need with people who have the skill set. And maybe between that, the kingdom of God can be experienced on a very small scale. So when you're done, you can uh, turn them in in the offering next Sunday or two Sundays from now, when, whenever it is those are filled out, because this is part of what you're offering to God. Or you can turn it into the office. You can scan it and email it. You can, however it is that's easiest for you to get this. Derek Best has also put a, a copy of this out on our website so that you can it can be downloaded if you lose it or if you're listening on the radio and would like to participate, I would invite that as well. Or you can also call the church office and we can mail one out if, if for some reason your printer isn't working or you can't download it if there's issues there or you just don't have access to a computer. I don't want that to be an impediment. So as the, the ushers and, and those who are assisting with the offerings this morning come forward, I'm going to close with a, another story that uh, Reverend Mather puts. He says, several years ago, Professor John McKnight gave a speech relating a remarkable history. Talking with his friend, Ivan Illich, sociologist, writer, and theologian, McKnight asked, Ivan, when did everything start to go bad? And here's his response. In a little Italian village in the 8th century, he said. In the little village, whenever a stranger knocked on a door, the stranger would be welcomed and given a place to stay and food to eat. In the 8th century, a monastery was built on the hill overlooking the village. And since it was a cloistered community, and they did not allow guests to stay with them, they built a little building on the back of the monastery for the stranger. One of the people from the village learned about it and spread the word throughout the village. So afterwards, when the strangers would stop at someone's door, the citizens of that village would send the stranger to the monastery to stay in the room behind the monastery. That was the first hotel. And it was then when the community gave away its power to care for one another. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we come this morning to receive a, a part of the total blessings with which you have given to us, and even just a, a tenth of that one blessing, so, God, we are so grateful for all of the abundance with which we have 
and with the calling out into this community to transform lives, to connect people, to inspire people to use their gifts for the benefit of glorifying you. May the offering, as well as our Helping Hands offering this morning, be used for just that, for your glorification. And may all that we do this week, in mind, body, and spirit, also be an act of worship.